I started doing drugs. I started hanging around the wrong people, alcoholism, parties, which ended up in me getting involved in criminal activities. I had already been in two rehabs. I am now on my way to prison. I had formed a lot of bad habits, hung out with the wrong people, and I had formed this pattern of behavior that was unconducive to the life that I wanted. I was accepting 100% responsibility for where I was. It wasn't the system, it wasn't the drugs, it wasn't the people I was hanging out, it was 100% me. So that question started leading me to, how do I be a better son? And to be a better man, and to be an honorable man, you're a provider, a protector of your family. And I wasn't doing that. I had to accept responsibility. Even with the pain and all of the crazy feelings that come with the realization that you're failing your family. When you make a decision to be better, who cares what other people think? It's none of your business. I didn't care about the rest of the world because I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I started studying the dictionary, learning 20 vocabulary words a week. It revolved around education being comfortable in uncomfortable situations. All right, everyone, welcome once again to Jill Collins Connections. We are here today with the one, the only, Jake Cortez. Jake is simply amazing. He is a best-selling author, investor. He is a sales guru, and he's a life and business strategist. I'm telling you, this guy blows my mind. Every time I get to see Jake, I'm just like, okay, what else do you know? What, tell me something new that I need to learn that I don't know. So I, I just absolutely love this guy. Uh, we've known each other for some time now. We both live in Miami and uh, we're both in the Tony Robbins Platinum Partner community. So um, I really wanna just dive right into Jake and hear what he's got to say today. You're gonna love his message. So Jake, welcome to the show. So glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I, I am thrilled. And I just, I was just looking at your new website that you said came out just a couple days ago, right? Yeah, Friday. Today is Tuesday. Ooh. You guys, check this link out when you see it. And by the way, I want you to get a pen and paper before right now. Don't forget. So you don't have to rewind and go back and go, oh my God, that was so awesome. Because he's got some good, he's going to have some good tips today. But his, the title of his website and who he is is Turn Your Trauma into Triumph. I want you to tell me a little bit about what you're up to in the world today and what got you there, because there's a really great thing about you. What I think is so important that you talk about or that you who you are is that no anyone can be successful, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've experienced, no matter what you've been through, it's mm -hmm. possible. Yeah, so a little bit about my journey so I can kind of give some background for yes, those please. who know me. Um, I, I was born into a very, very loving family, actually four women, four generations of women to welcome me into this planet. My mom, my grandmother, my great grandmother, and my great, great grandmother. So I consider myself extremely blessed and very fortunate to have had so much maternal wisdom in, around me all the time, um, pretty much all my life. And you know, zero to seven years old was amazing. It was perfect. My parents were together and I had a, a really good life. You know, we grew up in Lancaster, California, uh, which is, um, I, I think was really cool that my parents raised me in the desert. You know, it's kind of hard for kids to kind of get into too much trouble out there. You know, rough <laughs> life with the neighborhood kids, chasing tumbleweeds, chasing lizards, snakes, and fun stuff like that. At 11 years old, my life took a turn. Um, you know, my father was kind of like my best friend. You know, we used to play ball together. And then, you know, one day he, he sat me down on the couch in the living room in our house in Houston, Texas. And he's like, look, Jake, it's, it's not working out. Me and your mother were going separate ways. You're now the man of the house. And he left the next day. So that experience, at that age, I was about 12 years old, 11, 12 years old. And the meaning that I gave that event is that my father betrayed me. He betrayed the family. And the pain from that meaning was something that cut so deep. And I was too young to fully figure out how to deal with that in a way that was healthy. So in Houston, Texas, 
you know, I knew my dad smoked weed, you know, because I, I found it like when I was five years old, my mom wanted to kill him. Um, but I knew that my dad experimented with drugs and he'd been a functional addict pretty much all his life. So it was one of these situations where I didn't, I, I didn't like, I didn't see it any like bad type of way. I just thought that, you know, people sometimes do drugs. So when I moved from Houston, Texas to Miami, Florida, um, my mom had to start working seven days a week. Now I have two younger brothers and a younger sister and my grandmother's living with us, which she threatened to leave my, my, my mom and leave us because we were too crazy. Um, and then I like what ended up happening is since I wasn't talking to anybody about these challenges, I didn't see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Actually, when I was 15 years old, I was kind of like forced to go see a psychiatrist because I got into a school fight. And then what ended up happening is I started doing drugs. I started hanging around the wrong people, alcoholism, parties, and that which ended up in, you know, me getting involved in criminal activities. And by the age of 18, I had already gone to jail over 10 times. Uh, and now six months into my 18th birthday, after I had already been in two rehabs, I am now on my way to prison. And between the ages of 18 and 22, I got into enough trouble to go to prison for seven and a half years. So I, at 18 years old, I robbed a house, which was a really stupid decision that I made impulsively one morning after having a need to like pay some bills. And as I'm sitting in the back of the police car after I'd broken into somebody's house, like the gentleman got home and I knew he was in the military because I saw the pictures on the wall. And I said to myself, if this man were to open the back door here of this police car and pull me out while I'm in handcuffs and beat the crap out of me, I deserve this ass whooping. And, and I felt like crap. I really did. And that regret was enough for me to say that was stupid. You deserve whatever consequence comes of this. You're going to face it. And they wanted to actually let me out on house arrest. But I, I know I knew myself, I didn't have the discipline. Uh, and I had actually violated house arrests uh, after 33 days off something technical, I went to the store, I got groceries, I didn't bring back the receipt. And I was they violated me on a technical. So when they offered me house arrest, as a plea, like a year house arrest, two years probation, I said, No, I don't want house arrest, I want you to give me time, I'm going to do my time. And when I'm free, I'm free. It was it was the hard choice, but it was the right choice because I knew I needed discipline. I lacked discipline. My God, my my dad had been out of the house for God knows how long. I was uh, 11 or so, seven years, and I had formed a lot of bad habits, hung out with the wrong people, and I had formed this pattern of behavior that was unconducive to the life that I wanted to live. So long story short, um, they ended up indicting me on another charge while I was in jail, which I did commit, and they they ran them concurrent. So I'm I'm now doing two years, but instead of doing jail time, now I'm sent to prison. And there was a situation in prison where I got into a physical altercation with another inmate, and it was really bad. And I hit him with the lock, and I ended up being reclassified from a youthful offender to an adult, and. Um, all the while, while I was at the other institution, I wanted to leave that institution, not break out. I only had two years, but I wanted to go to another institution because in my mind, I was thinking any other institution would be better than here. That's what I thought. As I was reclassified, I hadn't showered in five days. I'm now being transferred to an adult prison, not only an adult prison, but what, where they house all the violent adults. So I'm 165 pounds soaking wet. I'm 18, 19 years old, and I'm being escorted into a uh, where they house the confinement. It's, like, it's called closed management. So you're 24 hours locked down in a six by eight cell. And this is where I was going to spend the next year of my sentence. As I'm being escorted into this quad, that's what they call them, quad. And the, the men are behind the doors. And I've got a belly chain and handcuffed at the hips to the belly chain. And then there's a chain running down to my ankle shackles. And when I walked in, it was quiet. You could hear a pin drop. But now as the chain is dragging on the floor, you hear that, but then you hear the guys come to the door 
And then some of these guys start catcalling me like I'm Beyonce. And I'm saying to myself, you really wanted to go somewhere else, huh? Well, look at look at where you are now. Like, look, look at where your idiotic behavior has ended you up now. Like, you really wanted this. So the officer escorts me to the cell. They take the chains off, put me in the cell. And uh, there's a guy yelling in the quad. And he's like, but I'm delirious because I hadn't slept in five days. There's no AC in Florida prisons. You can go like this and like the dirt rolls off of me. And I'm, I'm kind of delirious just sitting in a cell all by myself. Like it's just a daze. And I just keep hearing somebody yelling out there. And then I just started to pay attention to what he's saying. He's like, 207, 207. I'm coming for that ass. And, you know, I'm 165 pounds at this point. Everybody in this place is at least 200 pounds or more. And I said to myself, uh, well, first, I didn't even know I was in 207. So I'm looking at the, the numbers above the cells and I see 201, 202, 203, 204, 205, 206, 206 is in the corner. And then I'm in the next cell. And then I say, shit, I don't, I don't know how this works. Like, can this guy get over here or do they open the doors? And, you know, so... What, ended up, what I did immediately in that moment is I started doing jumping jacks. Started doing 100 jumping jacks and then 25 push-ups, 100 jumping jacks, 25 push-ups, 100 jumping jacks, 25 push-ups until like my fear or the anxiety was covered by just exerting my energy and then also preparing myself that if I did have to fight this person, then I would be prepared. Now, I say all of that to give you like, the first segment of my timeline, which I consider a different lifetime, because violence was reinforced. Like my dad, when Rocky came out, me and my two brothers were over the sink and we're eating raw eggs, just like in the movies. And then I have boxing gloves and my brother has boxing gloves and we're duking it out in the living room. So there was social reinforcement around physical aggression when dad's gone. And I was already kind of like a mischievous child that needed direction. I resorted to, since I didn't communicate my challenges or problems, because sometimes men will teach their boys. And, you know, this is kind of how it was in the household, like suck it up, men don't cry, suck it up, you know, and what will what we will internalize is it's not socially acceptable to have certain feelings. And since I couldn't have certain feelings, and it wasn't manly for me to share what was manly is for at this moment, it was immature masculinity where I was exerting physical, you know, and getting into physical altercations because I thought making sure other people respected you was a part of manhood. I didn't realize until I was probably like 22 years old, this is stupid. I'm going to have to fight a lot of people. I don't want to fight anymore, you know. And my to my advantage, I don't look like a like a fighter, but that would actually work to my advantage because I was always underestimated. So in the, from 18, like the end of 18 years old, turning 19, all the way into like before my 20th birthday, I was spending in closed management too. I had 16 different cellmates. Five of them had natural life sentences. I ended up fighting one of them. Um, which is it's an interesting experience because the door is locked like you, you you're gonna one person you know if the office, officers pass by every hour so you know you have an hour to figure it out like make sure there isn't anything in there that you can kill somebody with unless you know, strangle them or something but uh so and then there was a situation where I almost got into a fight with another guy which we were friends before and mind you, you're locked in this room 24 hours a day, seven days a week with this person. You only leave the shower. You only leave the cell for three showers a week. And the reason I tell you this is because that was probably the most revelatory experience of my life thus far, just due to the deprivation of sensory stimulus. So since I couldn't, there wasn't much happening in my visual in my my olfactory auditory it was just very restricted on every level 
it actually enhanced my ability and my sensory perception to the point that when an officer would walk into the dorm, just by the way that their keys jingle and their feet hit the ground, I could tell which officer this was. <laughs> so it enhanced my capabilities on one hand, but I also got to a point where it was like, okay, your life sucks. You've created this hell. You've come to the, you've come to the realization that you're not going to kill yourself because you created this hell and you are not going to end your suffering that you created and create suffering in the lives of other people because you just made a bunch of really bad choices. You're going to figure this out. So if I've created this hell, which I was accepting 100% responsibility for where I was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't the system. It wasn't my dad. It wasn't my mom. It wasn't the drugs. It wasn't the people I was hanging out. It was 100% me. So we got that clear. Second, you created this hell, which means if you created this and you, this is what you are manifesting physically because you have some unattended craziness going on internally means that you've created the hell you can create your own heaven. How do you do that? So that question started leading me to how do I build the man that I that I'd like to become, that I could admire, that I could be proud of, that I could be uh, consider myself a better son, consider myself a better brother, consider myself a better friend. I'd love to ask you a question real oh, quick on there, is because I see what you're saying with the you created this hell, and I that was one of the many thoughts I have here that I wanted to jump in on is is what I see a lot of people dealing with um, is when we go through and we make poor choices in life and, and it, we have, they can have lifetime implications, you know, whether it be incarceration or, you know, your record, having a record that you have to deal with as an adult and, you know, whether it's, you're able to get it expunged or not, what does that mean for you down the road, things like that. And, you know, I, I often see I mean, people who, we all do this, I think, but some, to some level extent, but the, the victimhood, the victim, Thing where you're saying I created this hell, so how can I create heaven? You said you said it. I'm taking personal responsibility. I'm 100 responsible for all this. Yeah. And a lot of times, things like personal responsibility are sneaky because even though we sometimes it's obvious I made this decision and now I'm paying for it, but other yeah. times things happen to us that aren't our fault, and then we're paying for it. You know. And so how do we how do we in spite of the fact that things don't go right? How do how did you find that that heaven? How did you have the insight? How, what can you tell someone who's maybe in jail right now or who's just gotten out of jail? And they're like, yeah, bro, but, you know, you've got a life now and I'm still like, I can't even get a freaking job because I have a record. So what yeah. do you say to that? Because I'd love to. That's the person I want to speak to. I want you to speak to. I want to reach. Great question. I'm going to I'm going to tell you a story. So this is my second bid. I'm I'm on my way. Like I in this situation, like. Okay, my first bid, I did all of my time. If you're good, you get out 80 and 85% of your time. If you end up with a lot of disciplinary reports, just like I did on my first bid, you're going to max out your time. So I, I, I did all my time on the first bid. My second bid, I want to go home as soon as possible. So I'm not doing anything. I'm not messing with anybody. Actually, correction, this is my third bid. My third bid, so my my first and second bid, I ended up maxing out my time. Like the first time, I didn't care. Take my game time. I have to fight people. I don't care. Second, I want to go home early, but I ended up getting into a fight. They took my game time anyway. So I, I didn't get out any earlier. Third time, I am convinced I'm going to get out doing only 85% of my bid. And there was a situation where the officer comes and starts searching my cell. He's not giving me a reason why. He's not giving me a reason of what he's looking for. And I'm at a privately run institution. State run institutions and private institutions, they operate different. In a state institution, I was pepper sprayed several times. They punched me while I had handcuffs. I was filing informal grievances from confinement to follow the chain of command to be able to, you know, get some sort of recourse or something like that and when I went to go take a shower because uh, they take you out of your cell handcuffed and take you to the shower they took all my reading my writing materials they ripped up all the papers so I felt like a cat without claws and I made in my mind like I don't like want to be in this situation again so on my third bid I made sure to get 
ship to a privately run institution because if somebody, one of the officers were to hit me, I, I would figure out who the largest shareholder is and write them a letter and threaten to go to the media if they don't fix this. So I had already had a plan because, you know, in both of my other incarceration, I ran into situations where officers kind of abused their authority. But I know that that's part of the game, right? Like, I know that that's a part of this, you know, like these guys are getting paid thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a year. I am here involuntarily. Like I'm here like by force, you're here by choice. Like, what's your story? Like, that was my mentality for these guys. Like, you got to turn yourself in eight hours a day for 20 years. That's crazy. But so I'm now being taken to the captain's office. They already packed up all my cell stuff, which means there's a high likelihood I'm going to confinement. I don't even know the reason. They take me to the captain. The captain says, we're putting you under an investigation, um, under investigation. I said, for what? He says, we don't have to tell you. And I was like, well, you kind of like, so imagine you're in prison, but now they're escorting you to jail in prison. So I'm like, well, you got to give me, he's like, we don't have to tell you anything. Take it away. So now at this point, I'm 26 years old. I'm taking an intro to psychology that I found Louisiana State University does correspondence courses. So now I'm doing a intro to psychology by mail. And I, and I actually paid a crooked attorney to ship me to this institution because I was at another institution prior to this in Rayford, Florida. This is where they housed Ted Bundy before they executed him. It used to be a death camp, a death row, and they converted it to a work camp. It was the most eerie experience of my life. But within three months, they shipped me to this privately run institution. And I'm taking this intro to psychology because there wasn't anybody that could proctor my exams in the state run, the state run institution. So one of the things that I did when I found out that I need to get to a privately run institution, I started doing my R&D within the institution. Like, hey, this is what I want to do. How do I do it? And like, hey, there's this guy in Tallahassee, this attorney, if you pay him 4,500 bucks, we'll ship you to a privately run. Institution. I was like, what? For real? He was like, yep. And I ended up doing it and got shipped. Otherwise, I'd have to wait a year or more. And then they would ship me on good behavior. So now I'm at this institution. Everything had been going fine. And they're taking me to the confinement cell. I knew nothing about a primary question. But my primary question looking back was, how can I find meaning in this? This is my guiding. This is my servile missile. Like, how can I find meaning in this? And as they're escorting me into this cell and I've got to bend over and put my hands out of the door so they can uncuff me. And I'm now in this solitary confinement cell with a bed, a mat, the toilet, the sink, and a flap in the door for them to open and serve me food, you know, three days a week. I mean, three days, three, three meals a day. I'm saying to myself, as I'm studying this intro to psychology, there's a term called relative deprivation. And relative deprivation is where I compare myself to somebody who's better off that has the car, that has the girl, that has the, the business. And I feel inadequate, less than unworthy. There's a feeling of lack. And this relative deprivation is, is almost endorsed in American culture. Like the, we, we have this sense that there are so many more, there's so many people that are doing way better than me. And I wasn't focused on that. I was focused on, Okay, relative deprivation, comparing myself to people that are better off, whatever. What about the the opposite, relative abundance? Like, Ooh. there's 300 million Americans on this planet. Like, there's 300 million Americans in the United States. At the time, there was probably like 6.9 billion uh, humans on the planet. 6.9 billion. Let's say 7 billion. Let's and I'm doing this math in my head as I just got escorted in here, you know, and it's all happening rapidly. Like, it's just not even something that I'm thinking about. It's just like happening rapidly. And I say, okay, 300 million Americans, let's grossly overestimate, say 2 billion people on this planet are afforded the luxuries we're afforded here in the United States and abroad. 2 billion, that's, that's a pretty gross overestimation, wouldn't you say? Yeah. So that's 5 billion people. OK, that have to think about maybe like clean water, food for their family, a bomb not falling on their house, being assassinated by one of these crazy ISIS or Al Qaeda, you know, things like five billion people. OK, not all five billion people would trade places for, with me right now, but I am certain that at least two point five billion people 
would want this bed, this roof over the head, and the room service that's going to be delivered to the door three times a day. <laughs> room service. Time. I love that. Yeah. Two and a half billion people. So I was able to take a moment that could have been classified as one of the top five traumatic experiences in my life. And instead of being sad or disappointed or depressed, I was able to flip it and find gratitude in a moment that that could have been that I could have internalized and, and, and created a different meaning. So the moment that I found gratitude in this moment, in my solitude, and was able to be thankful that I have the opportunity, that I had the roof over my head, that I had this bed, that I had the three meals that are going to come to this door. I was able to then perceive from this point on life in a in a different perspective, a global perspective. My dad was born in Cuba. My grandfather woke up one day and his business belonged to Fidel Castro. Do you think I have the luxury of sitting on my laurels and, and saying, oh, you know, I'm having a bad day. My Uber, my Uber canceled. And I don't know how I'm going to get to my next appointment. And life is so hard. No, I don't. Because my grandfather sailed across the Gulf four times to bring my family here. I don't have the ability to sit back. If I just pay attention to what my ancestors did to fight the fight, the blood, the sweat, the tears, for them to allow me the ability to have these freedoms, which I was really screwing it up in the beginning, but I realized regardless of the convicted fella and uh, you know all of these things, I still have it better than, I'm still in the 1%. You are. You are, you know, and I find that so such a great like your primary question, which for everyone who doesn't know is something that we've learned with Tony Robbins and is that we all have a question that's running in the background all day long, all day long, the same question over and over. Am I good enough or what's wrong with you? It could be a lot of different things. And for you, it was what is the meaning of this? OK, yeah, how, so how can I find meaning in this? How can I find meaning in this? So so you're this actually has served you quite well because it's really in a way there's 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 it's probably good and it's double edged sword. But to me, that's going into inquiry, which we've learned through many different um, teachers in our in our circles is going into inquiry and questioning everything, questioning like when we th have a thought, when someone when we have a, a belief or a reaction or someone has an opinion, is is that true? Let me, you know, how do I know it's true? Is it something that I need to think about? And and how does that land for me? Do I have to feel bad about this when it didn't go right? Or I feel bad about myself because I didn't it didn't work out for me. I'm blaming myself. OK, well, is that true that I, it's my you know, that I that I'm a bad person, whatever I'm making it mean, we have to look at that. And so I love that you use inquiry and questioning. How does someone know when maybe they don't have that gift is what I see a lot too, is just this whole thing of identity and feeling like I got in a lot of trouble when I was in a uh, teenager, I, you know, went through so few different things and, and, uh, you know, had, had my day in, in various places, um, wasn't actually incarcerated, but, uh, came close. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I can tell you, I, I see a lot, I, I still, I always felt like a bad girl. Like I grew I got in trouble in school. I was, you know, always the behavior problem, blah, blah, blah. So I, I, how did I, it took me a long time to shake that identity. And I think that I can only imagine, you know, I know I have people, I have, I'm on a nonprofit board for substance abuse and I've been on it for 20 more years now. And um, I have so many friends and people that are in recovery from addiction. And it's really hard to shake that feeling like you're good enough or that you belong in in a circle with people or because you've made so many mistakes you're still having to pay for all those mistakes and you never quite feel like you're 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 there i just see that with a lot of people that are dealing with things like either they've been incarcerated or they've been in treatment and they're just trying to get their lives together and it's they feel like they're it's like a reconditioned version of themselves like a reconditioned model versus a new and improved and even expanded because of the things they've gone through. How do you get my question going getting to there is how do we how do people in that space feel like they're whole and they're complete and they matter and to really alter that identity like you have in such a way that they feel confident, even in spite of everything they've done. That's a great that's a really, really good question. I you know, I didn't have to be anybody for my mother. You know, like I didn't have to be anybody other than myself, healthy, happy, free, right? So 
my mother never stopped loving me. She never stopped having faith in me becoming something. And the judgment, the 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 article that came out in the news uh, paper, the the friends giving up on me, none of that shook my mother's love for me. None of it changed how she felt and saw me. And for me, I don't. I didn't care about the rest of the world because I don't have to prove anything to anybody. If mm. my mother loved me, then I don't care about anything else. If my mother, if as long as my mom is still there and loves me and cares, like I don't care about the rest because it was, she's my true North. And I don't want to, because there was a day I'm sitting in confinement. I fight it. I fought somebody else. My mom, my mom drove nine hours to go see me. I didn't even know she was coming. And she can't even give me a hug because I just fought that week. I fought my cellmate that week. So she begged and pleaded that the officer allow us to see one another. And, and they finally conceded. And it was a 30-minute visit, which typically would be a four-hour. And she'd be able to hug me otherwise. But they allowed me to see my mom on the other side of a mesh, like a mesh fence thing. And I go back to the cell. And, you know, I have this conversation with myself. One, how many, how many more of these people do I have to fight? Why do I want the respect? And then finally, what does it mean to be a man? Because it sure ain't this. It is not this. Like, I want respect from these people, but why do I want it? I'll never see them again, half of these people. So... What does it mean to be a man? I started following that thread of the question. And what I had thought up until then is making sure that other men respected you and you had this presence. So that was immature masculine. And I said, this is, this is BS. Because if anybody hurt my mom, I'd hurt them. And here I am hurting her the most. How do I be a better son? And to be a better man and to be an honorable man, you, you're a provider and protector of your family. And I wasn't doing that at the moment. And I had to accept responsibility, even with the pain and all the crazy feelings that come with the realization that you're failing your family. I owned it and I mm -hmm. sat with it and I, and I made a decision to be better. So... When you make a decision to be better, who cares what other people think? It's none of your business what other people think. I don't care. I'm not here to please or impress another human. I will meet my maker on, on my way out of this. And that is the only one that has the right to judge me. You know, even like right now, this nice condo that I stay in in Brickell, this is the first time in like over 10 years, it's, 15 years that I've been able to use my own name to rent in a place that I want to rent for the mm -hmm. last five to seven years. I've been using my dad's name because they won't rent to me, you know, and I understand what people go through in terms of being a convicted felon and riding around with that stigma, but I never perceived it in the same way that people generally perceive it. Oh, uh, uh, I'm restricted or I have less capability. no, I saw this as an opportunity for me to become more resourceful, where you can just go in there and submit an application. I got to go in there and say, hi, my name is Jake. You know, I'm considering moving here. You know, when I was younger, I ran into a few, you know, bad situations. I ended up going to jail. And she's, is it a felony? And I said, yes, it is. She's like, automatic grounds for denial. I was like, thank you for your time. Have a wonderful day. And I just submitted the application under my father's name. And I lived there for two years. So like it's it for me, it's altering how you perceive what you perceive. If I perceive myself as an American and all of the opportunities, all this other stuff. No, I am first generation immigrant. Like my dad was born in Cuba, you know, and you trace that back. My, my ancestors are from Spain. So we fought long and hard to get where we are. Right. Political unrest in Spain. We leave there for Cuba. Political the, you know, communism, you wake up one day and your business belongs to Fidel Castro and now you're an employee in your own business. No matter how bad a day it gets for me, 
can't be as bad as my grandfather feeling that morning, like everything has been stripped for him and his own father is telling him, nah, just, just wait it out. It's going to blow over. And he was like, screw this. And th then he created a rift in the family, the people that stayed and the people that left. And that wasn't something that we could control. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying it happens to you, you can't control it. Look, we, our existence is more fragile than most people understand. We're sitting on a rock that's hurling through space at 66,000 miles per hour, rotating on its axis, tilting 23 and a half degrees this way, 23 and a half degrees the other way. And you want to tell me that you think you have some level of control? No. If you look at it for what it is, we existence is fragile. Our existence and us to be able to have the life that we have. I don't live my life thinking that anything happened to me by accident and that there's any reason for me to enter into this world of victimhood that doesn't exist in my reality. I am the creator of my experiences, whether intentionally or unintentionally, I create my experience. Now, if there's a series of experiences that keep reoccurring, Example, self-sabotage. You're getting a certain level, and for whatever reason, you run into a situation where you start just like irrationally procrastinating. Like you can't do what you need to do to get over the hurdle because for whatever reason, your brain is just saying, it's just not allowing you to get there. This is the moment. So this is what I got really good at after a while. I mean, you know, going to prison three times on my way to prison for the third time at 25 years old, I'm going to learn how to make assessments and become a practical psychologist like Tony teaches. This is why I was taking the intro to psychology, read books on sociology. I started studying the dictionary, learning 20 new vocabulary words a week. My, my evolution, I knew in order for me to get out of what I got myself into, it revolved around education, educating myself. And that's what you did in, in jail. You And I would love every, anyone who's watching this who's maybe incarcerated that has an opportunity somehow to see this is educate yourself. That was it, that was something you told me you did. And, and you're talking about just now is the 25 vocabulary words a week. And, and you were even studying and taking classes and doing all these these correspondence classes and things. Um, and that's great with the hope of knowing that you're not there forever. And right. then I'm thinking to myself, what about people who have a life sentence? Why bother? It's what I would almost hear some say. What, well, would, what is life like in there? And is it something that you could say from an insider's perspective that, you know what, you may be there for life, but do you want to go through that whole time, the rest of your time miserable? Or do you want to find a way to feel joy even within those walls? Yeah, you know, I would, you know, if I, you know, God forbid, but if, if that ever you know was a situation that i ever encountered i'd rather they just execute me than live out my life like that look I, I, it's but it's it's a situation where you committed the act and you have been deemed a menace to society so when the body is not in harmony it sends a signal like hey pay attention to me. you go to some of these doctors they prescribed you something to silence the signal but the signal is there for a very specific reason to have you pay attention so that this way you could help fix whatever's wrong life is the same way the frustration the anxiety the stress these are all indicators that you are not operating fully in alignment you are doing something that is not in alignment with your assignment Mm. We all have our individual curriculum. Some people are going to learn in this lifetime and maybe some are going to learn in the next lifetime. So for those that are living out the rest of their days in there is understanding your, the rest of your curriculum in this lifetime and not creating any more karmic debt. Because if you create this karmic debt and you carry this on over, you're going to have a lot to deal with. In, in, in the next existence and what have you. I believe that we come into this world, the soul is with the body. You have the mind, the body, the soul, and the spirit. Actually, it's the feelings, emotions, yeah. 
Yeah, right. The soul. Body, emotions, thoughts. Right. The soul is a compilation of like the emotions, the will, and your mind, soul. And the soul has its own course trajectory. You have your spirit, what I believe is what connects us to God, our higher intelligence, and then the body. Now, if you create this karmic debt, it's almost stored in like this whatever i don't i don't know how to explain it but i just know my my experience and unraveling and just making a conscious choice not to create any more karmic debt uh one of my coaches wes watson talks about your frequency is what you frequently see <laughs> yes. and that's brilliant i did so so i had to come to the realization that my internal state my internal homeostatic you know, baseline was a little chaotic and anxious and on edge. And even what I did for work, you know, in sales, you know, it's very, you know, dope, dopamine associated. You get a sale, you get a rush, and then it's on to the next potential client. But what I realized is I don't have to evolve anything outside of myself or even pursue anything externally. It's a matter of what I, what impression am I like? What an internal impression do I need to be, do, and become for the external expression that I seek? If if what I seek is to be a go-to person in business, uh, to be considered reliable among friends and and an honorable person, then I need to have a certain level of personal integrity. That if I tell myself I'm going to go to the gym six days a week. And I'm going to wake up at six o'clock in the morning. I'm going to do this. The moment we commit to something and we don't do it, it's eroding our own self-confidence. And if you can't keep your word to yourself, who's going to believe you? Yeah, I think I think it's so it's that's such an interesting point of view that you make because um, sorry, I've got a, my cables are getting all weird here. All right. Um, yeah, because. I think we're a lot of times we're sitting in the space of feeling stuck. And I think you are just, we don't all have, we haven't all been through something so traumatic as what you've gone through. And so I really appreciate you sharing your story today because I think it's so important to hear that one, if someone is in a space of incarceration, that they're not alone, that it's possible to make a change in your life. And two, even if you've come out of something really amazing or something that was difficult is you can break through free. You don't have to believe the lies that you tell yourself about being a second class citizen, about being no good, about whatever it is that people say about who you are. So it's who do you want to be now? Choose that identity and start to live it out. And then when you start to feel those thoughts and things that aren't that are not positive, that are that are going to bring you down, is inquire question that and say am i a piece of shit it's like is that true where did i who told me who used to say that to me did someone say that to me is that where i'm getting that from and then it's it's going into that space and really you know questioning and and uh reframing i think is a great way to think about it um so yeah i think that's really really awesome you know i'd love to hear too now about um what you're doing now and what people can I just want you to give people hope, like show us like how you started to make money and, and get out there even after you got out of jail. And and then you said, OK, I'm limited with some things here because I have a record. How can I do something? Um, people won't hire me. What are some things that you did and how did it happen? So people might be, get inspired and get ideas from you. Well, one thing that I did is I asked myself the question, how do I make myself indispensable to a business? Ooh, that's a hell of a question. Yeah. So and I have plenty of time to think about it. <laughs> if, if, if I drive revenue, like, yeah, I'm just, I am a salesperson within, within a company, but I have an entrepreneurial mind. I can help this business owner make sure that they capture every dollar that's possibly due to them. Not just by what I'm doing in sales, but every other thing that I could possibly notice that would help them go further faster. So before I was even released from prison, I was in a work release center in Pompano Beach, Florida. And I would, 
I was allowed, excuse me, out of the institution, uh, I would work, start my workday from 9 a.m. and I wouldn't complete my workday until 8 p.m., Monday through Friday and Saturdays 10 to 4. And I would go and it was the largest call center in the United States for relocation services. So if you're moving from Miami to New York, you submit your information online and then you'd have Jake and four other people call you, which if you're ever going to move, I would suggest you do not submit your information online because you're going to be called so many times and you're going to want to break your phone. So call the company you want to work with. But I would say call the two to three because what ended up happening is when people called us specifically, they ended up paying a little bit of a premium because it's just it just works a little bit differently. But uh, I in that time, 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday and Saturdays 10 to 4, I had only done face-to-face -face sales prior to that. I did a, a little cold calling. But what I realized very quickly is that it's a different type of sale. So I now have to, since they can't see my body and communication is 55% body language, 38% tonality, 7% words, I created like this persona. And instead of me going by Jacob, which I've always gone by Jacob all my life, I started going by Jake because mm -hmm. Jake is a lot easier to say on the phone. If I'm going to say my name 100, 200 times a day, I wanted one syllable. I'm always looking for my way for the way to make my life more efficient. What is the more efficient way to do this? What is a, an efficient process that I can continually just go in here and knock it out? Within my first year, I was able to put myself in the top five of a room of 70. And this is the largest moving broker in the country. And the least tenured individual in that top five was three years in. But I just worked my tail off. So I'm telling you all of that because if you focus on adding more value and doing more than what you're paid for, you will always have a place. So one was the question, how do I make myself indispensable to a business? Second was, how can I learn to love the things that people hate? How can I learn to love that? And cold calling, door knocking. And I would do the things that people hate. One, not only because it made me money, but I was also flexing the muscle of this is uncomfortable. I don't want to do this and doing it anyway. So I've already flexed my muscle enough. I probably knocked on over 10,000 doors in my lifetime. And having done that enough allowed me the ability to start flexing the muscle that would create the myelin that, that Tony talks about around certain activities and doing certain things, the muscle memory, around being comfortable in uncomfortable situations. So there's a book out there called Crucial Conversations. Those who can and are capable of having those crucial conversations naturally climb the hierarchy of business and life. And a lot of times you don't have to have the perfect plan. You just need to execute the plan that you have because execution today is better than executing the perfect plan next week. You just got to go do, iterate, iterate, iterate. I'm excited now because now I'm going to start embarking on coaching and all of this other stuff. I've never sold my own product. I've never sold my own service ever. So I'm pretty excited to see what that's going to look like. And because I do have a servant's heart. My mom is just yeah. the most loving human being. If any kid from the block wanted to come and eat, they ate at our house. And she was just always ready to serve and give, even to the point like when I was 11, 12 years old, 13 years old, I'm like, mom, why are you so happy all the time? Don't you know that people take advantage of happy people? It was my 13 year old self trying to protect my mom because now it's us, we're alone. But I realized that there is wisdom in that. There's a gift. The gift is trying to figure, is figuring out how to exercise discretion, live with your heart open, even though some people will hurt you. Some people will take advantage of your kindness. And this is why discretion is so important. But if you can continue to live with your heart open among the scars, among the wounds, life will flow to you because you're just living in abundance and your heart is open. But I will say it's very important to address the trauma, whatever trauma that's been encountered. Rumi said it best. The wound is where the light enters. And I didn't shy away from the darkness and the ugly and the filth. Like it was bad. It was really bad. And it, my situation was bad. But, you know, when you ask those questions, those directed questions, 
you have to have the intestinal fortitude to deal with the answers when they come. <laughs> deal with it. This is a part of your process. If it sucks, lean into it because this is a part of what's going to allow you to grow, to scale Mount Everest and to come out on the other side. It's not the destination. It's who you became in the pursuit of what you knew was your potential. I on, Go ahead. I'm on a mission to become the best version of myself. And I am the offering, delivering myself to the world. And in whatever way I can be of service to this planet, I know what it looks like to be on the other side. And now I've stepped into this place of love and abundance and caring and sharing. And I have a lot of gifts that I want to impart to the world that I learned through my own life experience. And hopefully I can prevent other people from having to experience that pain and trauma. Now, the flip side of that is, can you impart the pearl of wisdom without the painful stimulus? That's the, that's the thing I was, I loved what you said. In fact, I saw bullet points here. You talked about add more value than anyone else and make yourself indispensable and learn to love what people hate. Those are three things. That's beautiful. And then even you know, like be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. That's, that'll make you successful. And then you said for live with your heart open, even amongst the scars and the wounds, you have to have discernment, but to be, but to still live in, with your heart open and um and then live in a mindset of abundance yeah. being cautious and then but you, then you said the last thing which i think is so key that a lot of people miss is deal with the trauma first and that is a hard one because a lot of us say i, I see a lot of people who go and they stop using drugs or drinking on their own even and i'm not saying an advocate you know i i love think that uh to the 12-step programs are incredible right i love the 12-step program um and i see some who are saying i don't want any part of that i want to i've got i'm just going to lick it on my own i've got this and yeah. what happens is a lot of times and myself included anytime we're dealing with loss or with change in life is we don't deal with the the under what's going on under the hood so to speak is that there's things that are happening in the background inside that we're not even aware of as we start to heal is why did we drink in the first place you know, how did I deal with this loss of a job or of loss of a spouse or a change in our lives, you know, a, a parents breaking up? When we don't think about that, and the older we get, the more difficult one it is to figure out and uncover, right? And two is is that it impacts us in ways that we don't even we don't even see in other parts of our lives. So you said deal with the trauma first. What would someone do to deal with their trauma? How would you suggest they go about it? Is there a book? Is there a community? How do they find people that help can help them? So I, I just dove deep into Tony Robbins works, you know, and, you know, the date with destiny and all of these programs, you know, I was introduced to plant medicine. That's not for everyone, you know, you feel called to do that and have that experience. I do believe that it was helpful in, in, in my experience. Um, uh, sometimes we don't realize that we're running from the pain. And being physically incarcerated opened me up to the understanding that there are mental incarcerations, there are spiritual incarcerations, there are emotional prisons, there mm -hmm. are relational prisons, there is financial prisons, there, is, there are business prisons. You've now operated a business and got it to a certain point. It's not even, you're not even passionate about it. You can't even throw the energy you want into it. So it's a matter of having that self-assessment check, step away from the social media, step away from, uh, you know, things that, that are going to clog your brain, spend some time alone, you know, and the hardest part is really getting uncomfortable. It's, so I would have never willingly subjected myself to seven and a half years in prison i would have never willingly now a lot of people might want the things that i have been been able to attain through my life experience but if i told you what i had to go through to get them i'm not sure you would want that right so it's it's being able to willingly submit yourself to the discomfort how can i help in a healthy way continue to put myself 
in uncomfortable situations, cold plunge, it's not comfortable to sit in 40 degree water. And you would be amazed at what comes up while you're sitting in that freezing cold water. And most times you're not going to be thinking about pain or trauma and stuff like that, but you are going to be having the conversation with your brain. Like, why am I doing this? This sucks. I want to get out of the water or whatever. But it's those moments that you're able to flex certain muscles because it's so good for your body, but your mind is telling you no. Uh, sauna, steam room, training. Today I ran a one and a half miles on the treadmill. And if, if it wasn't my trainer there, I would have quit. I would have been done. I was like, no, I'm done with this. I'm good. I've, I've already lost like 17 pounds in the last 60 days. I think I'm doing fairly well. My brain is negotiating and, and I'm like running and hitting the time my trainer has set for me. So I am putting myself in positions to be accountable to one, somebody outside of myself, my trainer, I'm accountable to him. But you have to build up the accountability to somebody outside of yourself because you know you do it if it's for someone else. Sometimes you'll slip if it's for you. It's true. And That's true. Accountability is so important because we will slip if it's if it's sometimes we'll, we need people to believe in us and to stand there for us until we're strong enough to do it for ourselves, right? Secondly, vision gives pain a purpose. And you have to have a vision compelling enough to say, why am I letting this shitty experience or wound control the direction of my life? Why am I allowing this to dictate and navigate? We've all experienced something, you know, traumatic or that, that's been hurting us. But after like 72 Tony events, more than 20 ayahuasca experiences, I'm not going to sit here and trick myself and say, oh, I've, I've, I've still got more to heal and all of this other. When the healing is done, except the fact that you've healed, right? Like, at least I've come to a place where I don't need to sit on a pillow and cry and stuff like that at this point, because sometimes people get caught up in the feeling that is that they're receiving when they're connecting to other humans at some of these events and fail to realize that you've completed your process. So now it's time to take action. So true. We get stuck in those, don't we? Sometimes yeah. it's easy. It's because it feels good. The because the experience feels great. You know, it's like, oh, I just want more of this positive energy. But it's that transition at that point that is where do we okay, now we have to go and apply what we've learned. Right. And what is our favorite line is we have a lot of shelf help. We have a lot of shelf help, all the books that we have bought, all the workbooks that we've received from all these seminars and courses we've been to, but they sit on the shelf. So what are we doing with those books? Yeah. <laughs> that information. That's true. And the, the other way you could go about it is pick one person, pick one book and execute three of the most important points out of that and just mm -hmm. focus and get dialed in. We are, we, there we're all like dealing with infobesity. Like we're just like, there's so much information and like our ancestors didn't have access to all of this. Yeah. Imagine you could just narrow your focus and clearly decide where you want to be in the next three to six months. And if that seminar, if that workshop is not going to help you become more efficient to achieve what you're seeking in the next three to six months, why do it? Why do it? This is how I operate. If it's not going to help me achieve my goals that I have set out for myself in the next three to six months, this is not for me right now. And I just want to give some people perspective where I am now. You know, 2016, I got off of probation. One of my goals was to see as many countries as possible because all I had for a very long time was National Geographic and Ocean Drive magazine was a very a, a nice magazine I used to look at as well. But National Geographic, I wanted to see all these countries. So six days after getting off of probation, I was in Greece. We went to Athens, Santorini, Mykonos. And then I was in India, Abu Dhabi, uh, Portugal, which Lisbon is a very beautiful city. Um, then Spain, uh, Ukraine, the Netherlands, Costa Rica, Mexico, Cuba. And I went on, I went on a, a mission to get as many stamps in my passport as possible. Because if you win in certain areas, take the time to celebrate. 
But then what I was also doing is putting myself, understanding how big the world is and how culturally different things are. Because if I was born in India, do I have, can I have the same aspirations of owning multiple houses, having a ton of investment properties? Yes, I could, but I'm competing with like 1.4 billion people. So like that helped me have a global perspective and understand that since we are we are inundated with opportunities in this country, but this is all we know because I was I was born here. This is all I've ever seen. Then how do I see something that's always been around me unless I program my mind to recognize them? Mm. That's first. And then second is also understanding like Tony teaches, you are managing the business you are, and then you're managing the business you're becoming. You're managing the person that you are and you're managing the person that you're becoming because like Tony says, a business will never go beyond the self-development of the owner. If you are a $5 million a year person in terms of revenue you're generating for your business, regardless of how much you do externally, internally, you have that thermostat. Like you rent yes. a Ferrari. The, the people that are renting you the Ferrari don't want you to do 120 miles in the Ferrari. So they put a governor on it and you'll, you won't go past 95 miles per hour. What internal limiting beliefs have you adopted or accepted or internalized? Because I see the subconscious mind like a record player. And on this record player is a record. And that record, whether you're conscious of it or not, is spinning, spinning, spinning. Some of those grooves you put there, some of those grooves were put by life experience, people that you cared about, your parents, and those grooves are there. And that record is spinning. And unconsciously, you are creating something that is contrary to what you would like to consciously achieve. How do you access what you have stored on that subconscious record, on that record player that's playing back there? How do you, how do you access that? Meditation, breathing exercises, putting yourself in uncomfortable situations where you can just get at peace and ask yourself those very pointed questions and have the intestinal fortitude to deal with the answers when they come is something you didn't want to deal with. But when you put things in the back of your mind and the recesses of your mind, Tony says this, you have to kill the monster while it's small. And if there's things that are festering back there, address the trauma and the hurt first. Mm. It's less about what you have to achieve and it's more about who you have to be and who you can exude when you elevate your frequency then you start to attract things that match your frequency so for me it started in sales but the, the evolution was then i became a manager and instead of me 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 my numbers on the board i'm going to beat you it was we 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 i've got to put my faith in the collective then i partnered with uh, somebody else in, in the same industry and then from partners became owner and the owner of the moving company uh, call center that I had created is what got me to Tony Robbins Platinum Partnership. But in Platinum Partnership, there's three, there's generally speaking, there's three types of people. One, you're in the right industry, you need to optimize. Two, you're in the wrong business, you need to get out and see what's going to light you up. Three, your personal life is so screwed, it doesn't matter what you do, in business, <laughs> clean your house. That, that that's generally the category oh my god that's hilarious i've never heard that that's yeah, great well, that's my it's true no i'm laughing because it's true it's hilarious and then <laughs> so I, was in the office. I, needed to get out. I did my exploratory journey april april 2021 i got a call from my current business partner uh and he's like jake you want to be in this real estate deal you got to raise 1.1 million dollars I liked what he was telling me. I love what he was telling me about the deal, but I was inexperienced. I have no experience in the space. Okay, so I'm gonna stop you real quick. Everyone get your notebooks out. If you don't, haven't done it yet, this is the part that you're gonna say, okay, this is how one of the things Jake did. Listen up and everything, go back to all those points you made too, because there were some good, there were awesome nuggets there. This is really good. Um, I have four pages of notes already. Um, so go into, this is the how you did it. And one of the things you, how you took some action here business-wise because okay. you can't get a job necessarily easily because of your record right go in and get employment so i have never had like maybe two to three times in my tenure i've had a w-2 job every other job was commission-based and it was very easy for mm -hmm. me to walk into your business if i liked you and i liked your product or service to say hey 
I can sell, and I've done my research before I sit down with you, I can sell your product or service better than you can. And all I'm asking for is a shot to allow me the ability to prove what I can do for your business. What do I have to make? What, what do I have to generate in terms of revenue for me to hit this target that I'm comfortable making? How much do I have to make the business? So this is that was the conversation. How can you tell me no? So at that point, I'm not playing the same game that most people are, because regardless of my record, you like 99% of the other people out there is going to give me a shot because what do you have to lose? So in that regard, I've always had sales in my back pocket to, to allow me the ability within two weeks, I could be making a check. Uh, selling anything for anybody's company. So that wasn't a problem, but I got to a place in my life after business mastery, proximity is power. And I learned all these things. And I got back to the, the call center that I was running. I was, I was the manager there. And I said, look, Grace and Max, it was a husband and wife couple. And we went from a 1200 square foot office to a 3000 square foot office to a 14,000 square foot building because now we're moving household items and we're doing really good. And I said, Max Grace, I'm not going to say that your success is, is wholly attributed to me running the front end of your business, but I'm, I'm sure it's helped that I, I open the office at 8.30, I lock up the office at 5.30, I hire, I fire, I manage, I train, I TO, I close sales. I'm not saying that your success is wholly attributed to me being here, but I'm sh I know that it has helped. And at this point, it's no longer beneficial for me to collect big checks. Yes, I enjoy the money that we're making. And yes, the income is great. But if I get injured, you're not going to cut me a check because I'm a nice guy. I don't know. It's just it's not how this works. I understand. So at this point, it no longer makes sense for me to continue forward with you guys if there wasn't equity. A discussion about equity. And they're like oh. equity. So for those who don't know, you mean like to be a partner in the business to actually have a partner in the business and and take part in this the overall success of the company. Okay, got it. Now Just looking back, now looking back, I will say this. I learned sometimes it's better to not even have the equity conversation and just go for a profit share. Because if, if I would have done things differently, I would have just gone for profit share because in the end of the day, equity is not always the right play. So I will say that now, but I learned to, to, to now start making a statement around my value and understanding my value because yet the market is going to pay me, but I have to acknowledge my value in the marketplace. Otherwise, they're going to pay me what they think I'm worth, which I'm, I'm undercutting myself. They said, uh, we're not willing to, we're not willing to do that. Take 24 hours, come back. So the next day I came back, I got all my stuff and I left. I already had plan B. So we said plan B, that's probably a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I had already spoke to somebody else. I was going to run their company and I was already ready. Now, Tony talks about burning your boats. I burned my boats. <laughs> They're ablaze. Then I did really well. I joined Platinum Partnership because I I just gone to business mastery at that point. That was 2015. So the end of 2016, I joined Platinum Partnership. And this, this, this piece right here is what you want to write down. When my consciousness expanded around putting myself in the presence of people that were playing life at higher levels, they walk different, they talk different, energetically, they're emitting a different frequency. My consciousness had expanded, and now it was my responsibility to come back to my life and recalibrate my self-concept. So there's the energetic experience of learning and, and by osmosis, the experience of being in a container, a loving container where people are just playing life at different levels. Then there is the process of coming back and assessing your self-concept to see what limiting beliefs, what erroneous you know, patterns have you accepted and adopted that are preventing that next level. And in order for me to succeed, where I am today, I had to cut ties with an industry that got me to Platinum Partnership because I, I wasn't happy doing it. I didn't like it. And in 2018, on the tail end of my Platinum Partnership journey, my business partner locked me out of the software. She locked me out of accounts in January 2nd, 2018. And we had a three-year relationship. And I called her and I said, Doris, you know, it's clear what you're doing, which you want to take sales in-house. 
But what you don't realize is if you would have called me and told me that that's what you wanted to do, I would have helped you. I would have helped you. Mm. And now that you've made your bed, you have to lie in it. You owe, you owe me X, Y, and Z for this, that, and the other thing. She, she paid me and I moved on. So I didn't burn my boat. My boat's on fire. I'm just fanning the flames. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's, now it's like, okay, what's next? But I didn't want to start another business because I didn't, I, I realized there were aspects where I partnered, where I should have hired. And mm-hmm. I was learning things in business mastery and Tony Robbins, where I didn't want to overconfidently believe that I had all the tools and the strategies and the techniques. I'm just a really good salesperson. And if I can stay in my swim lane, I am a benefit to any company or organize, organization that I'm a part of. Because so I'm, I hear you. Yeah, I hear you saying sales is important. That's a really good uh, asset to have if you can, um, if that's something that you can get comfortable, get uncomfortable to do. And then the next thing I'm hearing too is, which is so true. And, and Business Master, by the way, for those who are watching, is a program that Tony Robbins offers a live event, and it's also virtual, I believe, um, twice or once or twice a year. Um, and we've all been to it several times, so that you and I have been. And um, so. The other thing that's so critical in why we do with the Platinum Partner community that we, we, you and I have invested in that and been part of that is because of the up leveling of the people in our lives. And that's what you were getting at. And I love that is that what it, what it meant to you, because a lot of times we're sitting with, you know, I talk about the 33% rule and it's the, you know, you think of like a triangle and the middle 33, these are, this is the people we associate with. So you divide it in three pieces and the middle 33% are those that you associate with on a regular basis. It could be, you know, coworkers, friends, family, people that we can't always change very much. So we have that space and they kind of keep us in our comfort zones, kind of keep us at status quo. And then there's the bottom 33%. Those are people that tend to pull us down sometimes, or they can, um, they're people that just need encouragement that we can help up and bring them up with us to go along the right, the way, if we can keep our mindset going and in, in, in clear, a good place. And then the top 33%, that's the part that we're talking about. That This is where I met Jake and where I've met so many people that I interview is up leveling and finding that top 33% of the community that in your community is who do I need to know that is where I want to go, um, where they're doing things that I know um, I want to do someday that I know they'll inspire me, they'll challenge me, They'll put me on, you know, my feet to the fire sometimes and they'll say, hey, bro, what are you doing? You know, get this together. You, you know, you're off track instead of just telling you what you want to hear. Um, they don't gossip. They're actually doing up to big things in the world. So how do you find those people? And without necessarily spending the money we spent for Platinum Partners, how can someone up level and find people out there that they can connect with? Because I know you're going to be starting coaching. I know you said you're not really coaching yet, but I have a feeling there are going to be a lot of people that are going to be reaching out to you in your Instagram direct messages and other places on your website now that are gonna want some mentoring and some coaching. Um, so where do they find those communities that that can be reasonable if they don't have a lot of money to start? Well, you know, I joined Toastmasters. It's, it's, a, it's a group where you go and speak and you learn how to speak in, in front of people. That was one of the groups that was really big. And my goal wasn't to become like this masterful salesperson. My goal was to master the art of public speaking. And as a byproduct of that pursuit, I then became really good in sales. So mm. my, a lot of times what, you're pers- what you would like is actually a byproduct of some larger pursuit. So figure out what the larger pursuit is and aggressively move towards that and reap the rewards of the byproducts that are naturally going to outflow that. So my experience after the, you know, my boats were burning, it was what's a high ticket item that I'm comfortable selling and a person that I could enjoy learning from. Mm -hmm. And at this point it was Caleb Antonucci, who was the youngest lion. I used to call him Simba. And uh, he was, he had this massive solar company in Arizona. So I left everything here. I put my stuff in storage and I flew to Arizona and I, there was internal cognitive dissonance. It's like, you're 35 years old, you're 36 years old, you're knocking on doors. And a a lot of people have a negative connotation around door knocking and salesy people. 
So as I was having this internal conversation, as I'm on a bird scooter, because I wasn't legally capable of driving at this time, and I'm an hour, not an hour, I'm up about a mile away from my first, you know, customer's house um, from an appointment I made, my bird scooter runs out of battery. And luckily it's Arizona in the nighttime, so it's not that hot, but I turned my bird scooter into like a real scooter and I'm just pedaling away. In my mind, I'm like, look at you, you're 36 years old, you know, you're knocking on doors, all this stuff, the mental chatter started to come. It started to like assail me from every side, like, you know, your friends are a lot further in life, blah, 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 and all these things. And I was like, and then the other side, which is the drill sergeant is like, shut up, man. You don't have a choice. You just go deal with it. Like, you know, like, shut up. You, you're, you're, you get to do this, not you have to, like you get to do this. And I ended up making it to the, the customer's house and he's actually leaving his house, jumping in his car when, when I arrived. He forgot about the appointment. Wow. And he was like, oh, JK. And I walked him back into the house. Long story short, I ended up closing that customer. And he became a customer. And within my first three days of arriving in Arizona, I was, I closed my first sale. And then in short order, I was the top salesman in the company for the, for the time that I was there. So oh in this God. time, it wasn't about building a business, entrepreneur and all this stuff. It was studying while I was generating income. And I had no idea that you can make this type of money in, in you know, solar sales within my first year, I made $180,000 knocking on doors. I had no idea that you can make this type of money, but it was, I have very little financial responsibilities at this point. I always like to keep my overhead as low as possible, you know, outside of my investments and all of this other stuff. But at this time I have my reserves because a lot of times salespeople don't have reserves, but like I've elevated out of that, you know, short term thinking for salespeople. I've elevated out of that short-term thing and always put in reserves. You know, I, I have, I, I, I've i made my life, created my life in a way where I can become my own bank between my life insurance policy that I can borrow against, Bitcoin that I can borrow against, and allows me the ability to know that I have my emergency. So after those two years in Arizona, COVID hit, it's not a very good time to be knocking on doors. I moved to Dallas briefly because I thought I was going to live there. And I learned very quickly one other place I never want to live again. It's just, you know, I was spoiled with the mountains in Arizona, but now I, I'm landlocked. You got a lake there. I went jet skiing on the lake. After that, I had nothing else adventurous to do with nature. So I came back to Miami. I did a short, brief uh, time with Gary Brecca, with kind of like operating in the capacity of a COO, helping scale their business before they merged with Grant Cardone. And how how old were you when you came back to Miami? I am so twenty twenty one, and I'm turning forty two. So so forty thirty nine forty. Okay. Yeah, thirty nine. And, and I, I love the comment real quick. I love the comment you said. Be your own bank. Be your own bank. That's pretty sharp. I like that. That's the ability to have investments, things that you own free and clear, but you can borrow against. For smart investing, yeah, not, not not bad and not bad debt, but good debt. Like good debt. If you have a, if you have a, a property that's you you paid off and you want to go buy another property, you can take a mortgage on it, not to pay off credit cards or to live on, but to go and take that and go buy something else. Yes. Or you have an investment account, you can get a margin account on your investment account if you if you manage it, and you can do that and borrow against your investments, and there's still you still have money in play, which is very cool. Or yeah. maximizing and investing more with the margin. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the richest family in the world have understood the power of compounding. You know, you know, one of the biggest, richest family in the world, every single member of that family gets a life insurance policy out on their life, $10 million. And when they die, that $10 million goes into the family trust. So imagine they're dealing with the compounded results of these very powerful tools and a lot of times we're not thinking in terms of 10 20 30 40 50 100 years that allows us the ability to maximize the power of compounding mm -hmm. if i'm cost averaging and something i believe in i do believe in bitcoin you know you have you know you have a lot of people that are now well 
what allows me to believe more in Bitcoin is understanding that fiat currencies, the average lifespan of a fiat currency is 27 and a half years. Google it. Okay. And fiat currency just means paper money that's not backed by anything. Yes, it's backed by the, 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 the US military. It's backed by you know, our ability to protect other countries. Great. But in, up until 1971, it was backed by gold. Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard. We're well beyond that 27 and a half year threshold. So if you understand the history of money, then you understand that we are, we are about to acclimatize to a different way of transacting and it's digital. What does that mean for you and me? Yet to be, remains to be seen, but I am banking on, you know, people looking for alternative ways to transact. And I, I don't really see Bitcoin as that transaction vehicle. I do see it winning the category of digital gold. That mm. is what I see. That's what I see Bitcoin having done efficiently. It is digital gold. I mean, there's only one transaction per seven seconds. It's not made to transact in mass. So I dollar cost average there. I've got my life insurance policy. These allow me to act as my own bank um, and do the things that I'd like to do. So moved from Dallas back to Miami. And one of the things that I did really well is I made myself mobile and the ability with, I have virtual assistants. I have a team in India that, that does my social media, which I could plug and play them into any business. I made myself really mobile so I could basically piggyback on other people's vision, add value, make the money I want to make. And potentially, if I believed in it enough, some equity play. What I realized, though, and what life kept telling me is you're building other people's empire. You are building somebody else's kingdom. So mm. it was time for me to take the initiative to create my own product, to create my own service, to create my own initiatives, so that this way, if I am not doing so well or failing in a certain area, I get to iterate, but I don't lose because it's my brand. I don't lose. I just iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate. I don't fail. I learn or I win. So now I'm embarking on that process with my brand and, and your brand is your stand. And really your brand is what people say about you when you're not present. That's really your brand. And mm -hmm. I've always been a relationship person. I am better at relationships than I am closing sales. In order for me to close sales, I develop relationships very quickly. And in the moving industry, you know, we didn't have the, the company I worked for, which had a beautiful name, American Van Lines. How patriotic. I mean, the owner was an Italian immigrant, uh, but it, it was a great name. But I had to close people on the first sale because we had 73 complaints on the Better Business Bureau with a D minus rating and we weren't paying for accreditation. So I had to close people on. I had to become masterful at the one call close. And I loved the like figuring out the psychology of the sale to get somebody comfortable enough to give me their credit card for a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollar deposit on the phone on a first phone call. I loved that process. And even if people hung up on me, it was okay. I call them back. I'm sorry. I believe we got disconnected. And I'm like, what so did you say? Did you say, I think we got disconnected? You said that the other night to us when we were having dinner. That was hilarious. Is, when yeah. someone hangs up on you, go, Oh, I'm sorry. I think we got disconnected. Is that what? <laughs> yeah. Give them, the, allow them the ability to save face. It's rude, yeah. but allow them the ability to save face. Some people's like, some people will tell you, No, I hung up on you. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, did I say something wrong? And you can pick the phone call up, you know, and I've been able to close people after that process. Wow. You know? And then I'm telling you all of this because there's an elev elevation in my mindset and consciousness around certain things that I'm doing. So April, 2021, I get a phone call from somebody I made a big enough impression on that I have not seen or heard from in three years. So, I mean, we maybe have spoke like a year prior to this briefly. And Neil, my current business partner says, Jake, I got a deal. 77 year old man, he was done with the property. He wasn't going to take it through development or anything like that. Just wanted to sell the property, 195 acres, 
one million eight hundred and ten thousand. We got the seller to carry a note for eight hundred and ten thousand, essentially saying that the seller's financing eight hundred and ten thousand, six percent balloon in three years. And a lot of this stuff I didn't understand in the beginning. It sounded like a great deal, but after this phone call, well, first off, on the phone call, I didn't doubt that I could do it. Second, my relationships are the most important thing in my life. So I, don't, I won't compromise them for anything. If I find a great deal, I want to take it to my closest friends and family. And I want us all to win. I want us all to win. So my next goal was to get somebody on the phone who's as tenured as Neil that has nothing to do with the deal. Mm -hmm. Sent on the drive. He looked at everything. Now we're on the phone. He's having an intelligent conversation about the deal he just reviewed with Neil. I'm hearing them pitch and catch. I heard how good a deal we had. I framed the deal and I went and found $1.1 million, which I was able to raise all by myself. So consciousness expanded, recalibrate self-concept. I got a, a text on Facebook from somebody I've never met in real life. And they're like, Jake, if the deal is still available, I'm good for a hundred grand. And I read the message and I say to myself, first off was like, what the heck have I been doing with my life? Second was, how does this guy feel comfortable wiring $100,000 to a title company for a deal from a guy he's never met? Mm. So the answer started coming. And the, the first thing was there's continuity across social media platforms. It's Jay Cortez on Twitter. It's Jay Cortez on LinkedIn. It's Jay Cortez on Instagram. It's Jay Cortez on Facebook. It's Jay Cortez on every social media platform. There's continuity with my yeah, brand. Continuity, I mean, your brand is the same. Your name, your profile name, everything's the same. So they can find you in multiple places to check you. Correct. Got it. Second, he had obviously developed a relationship with me and I'm not privy to it. So my posting stories, my posting Hosts, he had obviously developed a relationship with me that I wasn't privy to. And then third, most important, the deal sold itself. When we provided the operating agreement, nobody gets any money until the investors get their money back. We, at worst case scenario, and I learned this about raising money. If the investor can look at the deal and at worst, we can fire sale this property for more than what we bought it for, the at worst scenario is not bad. So the investor is looking, the first question the investor is asking, is my principal at risk? And through analysis and going through the data and understanding what the market, what's happening in the market, which Neil said, there's a Cracker Barrel and there's a Chick-fil-A. <laughs> so... So this is this is a deal. Jake. Like these people do their research. Up. They do. They spend a fortune uh, those chains on on placement and location. Follow right. them. That's right. So, and and this is the last pristine parcel in that area, and we're in like Crestview proper. So it's like Dr. Horton was chomping at the bit. What made it easier for me to raise the money is we already had an LOI from Dr. Horton. Oh, you did? So, oh, okay. Because they, you were going to flip it to them. Yeah, no, we're flipping it to them at seventy-two thousand five hundred a pad. We have one hundred ninety-five. Oh, so you're going to entitle the lots for? You're going to entitle the property first, get them ready for to finish lots, and then sell them lots, finish lots. We're going to sell them pad ready lots. Yeah. Exactly. So, so right now we're at the stage they've already done the HOA stuff. We have the ratified contract from Dr. Horton. They've agreed to pay seventy two thousand five hundred a pad ready lot. Dr. Horton, what I've learned is they're a publicly traded company, and it, it's Top not line. typical for them to sit with this on their books over years. So they'd rather buy the pad ready lots and do what they do best, just come and build and sell homes three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars. So mm -hmm. they're going to turn around and, and do really well on this part of the process. So now this is why I'm moving to Panama City Beaches. Neil is a bad teacher, but he's a great, he has just a wealth of wisdom. So by osmosis, I'm going to learn by being by his side, understanding this. This first deal was single family. The rest are mobile home parks. The second one was 185 acres, 600 pad mobile home park. We raised 3 million for that one. The third 
was 640 acres, 15 minutes from the ocean, six minutes from an international airport. And mm -hmm. we got we got that property for a steal, $1.8 million, 640 acres. About 300 of the wow. acres are wetlands. Okay, so you got half there, yeah. And how many can you do per acre? I know I, my, my real estate, my land acquisition stuff's coming in. I flipped a property Deer Horton years ago when I was working for KB Home. So yeah, so I'm familiar how many how, well we should probably you know what we should do we should actually make this another video and yeah. get people interest who are interested in doing some real estate training with you because you've got some killer stuff yeah i, I tell us about tell us about the deal you got going we'll we'll wrap it up there i want to hear about okay this. so we got 141 pad mobile home park in panama city proper uh 1998 this this pad this mobile home park uh was the inception of this mobile home park was 1998 uh hurricane michael blew away a good portion of the park so like 82 mobile homes would have to be like there's 82 vacant lots me and my business partner own a mobile home dealership so we will be selling the mobile homes into the park which we're looking to make about 40 to fifty thousand dollars each mobile home currently we have 59 people that are paying 300 dollars a month and once we fill the park, we're going to raise the rents to $400 a month and we'll turn around and flip this mobile home park in two to three years for 12 to 15 million. That's how it's done. Very yeah. good. Very well, very well done. That's yeah. So you're moving to Panama City to be in proximity to be able to learn from um, from him and also to do the work on the steel. That well, this deal is uh, uh, the the flagship project is we got the approval to build the second largest mobile home park in the state of Florida, twenty five hundred pads. It's not in Panama City like this one. It's on the, it's on the outskirts. It's in Southport. But the reason that we were able to get this approved, city water and sewer, which is amazing, yeah. You like this typically doesn't happen, but I believe God is with us and. Somehow we just got blessed with a really amazing deal. Um, 2,500 pads. This is going to be an eight to 10 year project. Uh, Neil's son, Adam, has got the license for the mobile home dealership. So I'm going to go up there and help Adam sell mobile homes. I'll be working as the finance manager for about a year or two. I just want to get the, 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 the underlying core of this business from the ground up, understanding selling mobile homes, what it takes to run a mobile home dealership, and then just get into the process because people are already sending me mobile home deals from all over the country because of that one reel that went viral where I'm talking about mobile homes. So I am in the mobile home park business, but this is what I was doing mentally. 2016, 17, 18, 19, I created what's called a definite major purpose statement after reading Think and Grow Rich. A lot of people gloss over this chapter or this page where it gives you the breakdown on how to make a definite major purpose statement. In my definite major purpose statement, I said, you know, Jake Cortez, global warrior, I am generating $100,000 a month from my businesses and real estate. Uh, well, I didn't even say real estate. I said entrepreneurial activities because I didn't know. I I was certain that it probably wasn't going to come from what I was doing then, but I had to be fluid enough to allow for however it came for me to be able to move and take advantage. Because a lot of times opportunities will come as long as you've been doing the preparation. Jim Quick says it, opportunity is like a bus. It's going to show up at that bus stop. Mm -hmm. Be there every week. Now, just because that bus has shown up and you, you, boarded that bus doesn't mean you have the fare to take that bus. Have you prepared yourself? Have you put in the work to understand the ins and outs of the things that you'd like to accomplish? For me, I look at life in the world of business simply. I want to make the most amount of money with the least amount of humans possible. Why? Because humans will call in sick and you have this and you have that. For me, in order for me to have the impact that I want to have, I want to come from a place where I'm pouring from a full cup. I don't want to run a nonprofit organization and I look like I make no profit, right? Like for me, that just doesn't make sense. I want to be coming from a place of abundance so I can pour into people's lives 
And the only way to successfully do that, that I've been able to ascertain over the last two to three years is don't start a business, buy a business. It's already cash flowing. Mm. And for me, I would buy a business. If I'm going to buy businesses, it's going to be self-storage, you know, something maybe like a laundromat. I don't want, you know, I'm here in Miami and everybody has this sexy business approach and it has to be sexy. I don't care. Give me a boring business that's cash flowing, that the margins are, are great enough for me to take care of the, the operating expenses of the business with a healthy margin. So where all of my personal expenses are covered by this monthly revenue that now I have this surplus that's coming every month. For me, by cash flow, it makes the most sense, whether it's multifamily, in my case, it's mobile home parks. We're going to make money on the sale of the mobile homes, but we're going to make $600, $600 a month in lot rent. times. Right. 20. That's what I was going to say, because you already you're going to buy that and you already have people that are paying rent. So you, you, you start you start off at the gate. You don't just have a piece of land that you've got to develop first. You actually have people already there that are that are paying you rent. Yeah, this is that are still there. That's amazing. You know, and, and I, I want to. Um, so buy cash flow is what you said. Buy cash flow. Buy cash flow. Who I, you know, that's brilliant. And here's another thing. This is what I, I want to kind of bring this to a close. But um, but I do want to say something of that I've I, that I figured out that I did not realize about you that I think is one is your biggest strength okay. is you're not afraid to get in the weeds and you're not afraid to do the hard stuff. And we will say the hard stuff is like, yeah, I made that cold call or I called so-and-so and I got that thing that happened. I got on that stage and I was really afraid to talk in front of all these people. You said, I don't care about the sexy businesses. I want, I'll do the boring business. I'll buy the boring company. It's cash flowing. You're the one who says, and I've learned something from you because that's really helpful for me even personally is, is it's like, I don't give a shit what anybody thinks. It's like, if it's making me money, and I got to knock on doors and sell vacuums or I got to sell, you know, I'm going to sell solar. I'm doing it and I'm going to make money. And it's like, how many times have I thought and been too proud to do something because I said, what will people think? And you're like, I don't give a shit. I'm just doing it. And at the end of the day, nobody's looking at you any differently going, what do you do now? And nobody's saying that. They're just looking at you because you're so dang awesome and all the stuff that you've done and the energy that you exude and mm -hmm. just the, 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 the inspiration you are to so many with all of the things that you're up to mm -hmm. and um you're you have the biggest the most giving soul and heart the spirit that you have the i know you're mentoring people you're mentoring people who've just gotten out of jail yeah. you're, you're you're wanting to do more of that um i know your new website is out there that you're going to be doing some coaching with people and also you speak and you have a ted talk and a book that you've yeah. been a part of and i know you're going to do more with that um what is just one i want to I would, could we could talk for hours on business ideas because i think it's so valuable and i do want to do another one with you on this and just kick around things that people can get i think it'd be like 52 ideas of how to make money or something it's just like you know something where you could give people just inspiration they go oh really i could do that oh coin laundry oh i didn't think of that you know it's that actually makes money you know right now um so what is one thing that you could say to someone who walks away today what is one thing and they could be doing it? They do one thing. What would it be? So I would say focus on buying cash flow, whether it's a cash flowing business, cash flowing real estate. I'm in the real estate space. I'm going to stay in my lane. I'm going to learn the ins and outs of this mobile home park game, which I've learned a ton already in the last two years. And I'm going to concentrate my energy and understanding this business and this niche better than anyone else out there. And the, the cool thing about this niche is there's not a lot of people talking about it because even here in Miami, there's no way you're going to get any of this land zoned for a mobile home park. They just don't want it because they don't make any tax money. But right. buy, the focus should be either buying cash flowing real estate or buying cash flowing businesses. Now, on the business side, the advantage is so many boomers are retiring. And if you were to call them and say, hey, look, I have the skills, I have the expertise, I have the knowledge, I have the ability, let's have a conversation of what it would look like me buying your business. You can do a leverage buyout, you can, you can, you can structure things in a way where you don't have to come out of pocket with a large amount of money. And you've now befriended somebody who you've met what they are trying to achieve. They want to retire out of the business. Give them the ability to retire out of the business and structure things 
favorably for yourself in terms of an earnout or a leverage buyout that allows you the ability to take over the business with not without having to come out of so much of your own pocket. Cody Ooh. Sanchez teaches on this. Roland Frazier teaches on this. Carl Allen teaches on this. The thing about today's world is we are inundated with so much information, you don't know what to pick. But pick two things. You're buying real estate that's cash flowing or you're buying businesses that are cash flowing. Who do I need to learn from? And that's it. Hi, I love that. I love that. And it's it's um, <laughs> it's great. It's so brilliant. It's so brilliant. You know, it's it's I, the thing that you hit that hit me so much is the baby boomers. You know, so many times there's I, I being in the in the uh, construction or business, uh, the re residential home building business and commercial as well. You know, you see a lot of engineering companies or someone who's got a you know the guy who runs the company and it's his name and he's his kids are not interested in the business. And so, or it's something that could be, you know, the people that are doing sanitation and, and all the cleanup and they have generations that have been running that business, that company, and then they don't have any kids that want to do it. And so what do they do? They end up just fading it out and just fizzles out or, the, or somebody runs it till they're 90 years old and then something happens and then they're sitting there scrambling, trying to figure out how to just, how to, you know, dispose or how to, how to um, cash out on it. And it's really sad. So I think that's a really brilliant idea. Is it to hustle? You got to be willing to hustle a little bit, right? You got to be able to hustle. And in the end of the day, I don't even hustling. It's it's in my it's in my blood already. Like I don't care about making that call. I don't care if somebody says "f you" and hangs up on me. It actually used to just get me going in the morning. I wish within my first hour somebody would say "f you" and hang up on me when I used to do over the phone sales. It would just like get me juiced. Like, <laughs> It's not personal rejection. They don't know you. Who cares? For me, it's another no, which means I'm that much closer to a yes, because in the law of averages, and this is what's helped me, investing, raising money is a lot different than sales. If I, you walked into Best Buy and you already have a nice toaster, but I convinced you to buy this amazing toaster that toasted your toast perfectly. And you were just so enamored with how I was conveying the features of this toaster that you bought it. Forget it. I'll spend the hundred bucks. So what? You take it home and it blows up two weeks later. You're probably not even going to really stress out or you throw it away. It's not even worth the trip back to Best Buy. I was able to emotionally sway your decision into buying that toaster you didn't need. Now, the distinction with investing is I present you the deal. It meets your investment thesis or it doesn't. If it doesn't, I am not going to convince you because you're you're investing, you know, 100, 200, 300,000 dollars for this investment. There isn't any emotional swaying and if I can emotionally sway you in the in, into the deal, I don't want you as a partner to begin with. Oh yeah, that's so true. That is so true and we have people that we try to yeah, you, you don't cuz they end up being it ends up being a liability at the end of the day. It ends up being a liability. Timeline slip in real estate. We need people that understand the game. We me and Neil out of our own pockets, have paid $400,000 on this first deal. We are not doing capital calls on any of our deals. If we have, if we need more money for our deals, we're going to go out there and find it. We are scrappy. We will make sure that it gets done. That's not the that's not commonplace out there. But if you operate with that level of integrity and people get to know you in terms of business and how you operate and how you move, and they get that sense of trust and understanding that Jake, when I partner with Jake, He's going to look out for my interests like he looks out for his own. If they understand by my movements and the actions that I've taken, then there's a sense of comfort, right? But I will tell you, in the first deal, we did timeline slip because we're dealing with governmental agencies. But it doesn't change the fact that we found a deal. 77-year-old man just wanted to be done with it. Now, our sixth deal, two sisters inherited the property from their, from their father who just died, and they inherited this property and 18 others, the number on the sign doesn't even reach anyone. It's disconnected. The number for the mobile home park sign is disconnected. They don't even care about the business. So who's going to go out there and find the deal for you? Are you knocking on doors? Are you making the cold calls? Because if you're not, find somebody to do it. And in some cases, that'd be me. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. That's true. Man, you're such an inspiration. You're such an inspiration. And I know this is going to serve so many uh to hear your story and to hear all the things you're up to and i just encourage everyone to check the links below and find um find jake find jake and get in his space and jake jake is also 
like the best connector I've ever met. He's amazing. Like he is the one, he's the person who just brings everybody together. So he's seriously good at relationships. So if you want to up level, get in Jake's, Jake's world, find a way to get around him and, and anybody that he touches and he's, he's a part of, you definitely want to get to know everything he's got going on, learn about him, read his book, uh, watch his Ted talk. He's going to be doing more speaking engagements. I know very soon. And, uh, so thank you again, brother, for being here. I appreciate you. My pleasure. I enjoyed it. So yeah, if anybody, if I've impacted you anyway, or any yeah. parts of the story has like resonated with you, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out to me on Instagram, Jay yeah. Cortez, Jay Cortez on Facebook, Jay, Jay Cortez. Oh, wait a minute. I think it's official Jay Cortez on Twitter. Just I'm going to put all the links below. I'll have it all. All right. All right. Yeah. So the links will be there. Anyhow. My goal in life is to become the best version of myself and just as an offering, serve myself to those who, who want a better life. We're all, my goal, having understand how cruel humans can be to one another through my life experience is to contribute to adding more humanity to this world, to this planet. We're brothers and sisters. We're all having this life experience together. We're all on our own individual journeys. But if I can just be kind and I can just show you some of the things that, that I've learned through my life experience, my life will be richer, your life will be richer, and we can help elevate consciousness for the children that will inhabit this planet when we're long gone. So beautiful. So beautiful. Beautifully said, brother. I appreciate you, Jake. Thank yeah. you. You as well. And yeah, definitely follow on, in, on social channels as well. I, I'll have those links in the in the bottom in the description. So, thanks again, everyone. Appreciate it. Leave some comments. Tell tell us how what you think. What do you want to hear more from Jake on? Maybe we can get him again. If put it in the comments, let us know. All right. Awesome. All right. We'll have an amazing day on purpose and stay connected. Take care, everyone. Bye, guys.